Hi. Thanks for joining me again for our continued series in God Words. Theological terms that I think it's important for us to understand as we consider God's invitation to be in fellowship with Him. Last time we were looking at the term sanctification. It has to do with God making us holy. And I noticed as, as I was editing and re-watching uh, that conversation that there's kind of a, an oxymoron, maybe I'll call it, an a, a apparent contradiction of things, uh, that I talk about us being sinners in the present tense, uh, as well as being made holy in the present tense. Talk about us being dead in our trespasses and sin, uh, at the same time as talking about us being holy. And um, the term that I want us to look at today is not one that we find specifically, the words aren't in the Bible, it's, it's, the term isn't in Romans chapter 6 or chapter 7. But the idea of it is strongly present in Romans chapter 7. So let me read uh, a few verses for Romans chapter 7, uh, and then we'll get into this term and, and talk about it. Starting at verse 7 of chapter 7. What then shall we say? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin, by effecting my death through that which is good, that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For that which I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find, then the prim I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members." Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. So, this is the predicament of life. The term that I want us to consider today is one that uh, is dear to our tradition, uh, a term that Martin Luther coined uh, when he recognized 
this same problem in himself. He said that he was at the same time saint and sinner. Simul utus et peccator. The Latin for it means, at the same time, saint, or justified, and sinner. And this is the condition that we live in, and the condition that Romans chapter 6 addresses, and the condition that Romans chapter 7 addresses, and the condition that Romans chapter 8 comforts us in. Here's the reality. We begin dead. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. And so we recognize that we are dead. Other terms for it is that we are, that we have an old sinful nature. We recognize that from the moment of our conception, we are separated from God. And the only thing that we can do is rebel against God. We cannot, by our own reason or strength, that's another phrase from our tradition, from our small catechism and the explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed. We cannot, by our own reason or strength, that means by what we think or by what we do, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to Him. That's dead. And we earn eternal separation from God as a result of this sin that's in us. That's really what death ultimately is. So we have, we have a condition that's dire. God, however, wants us to be in fellowship with him. He wants us to be in fellowship. Yes, that begins now. But a fellowship that ultimately is one that will exist for all eternity. And so, in order to solve this problem and to bring us into fellowship with himself, he came to us. He came to us incarnate in Jesus Christ, who became our sin, who took upon himself our sin and suffered the consequences of our rebellion, suffered the consequences of our breaking the law, which is all we can do, died the death we deserve. And so then we saw in the beginning of Romans chapter 6 that his death then is brought to us personally, made effective to us personally, as he welcomes us and brings us through the waters of baptism. That when we are baptized, and Paul puts it in a rhetorical question, believing that we know the answer to his question. Don't you know that when you were baptized? So, the understanding of Romans chapter 6 is that we already know this as a basic truth of our fellowship with God. The basic truth of what we believe. That when we are baptized, we die with Jesus. We are buried with Jesus. And... We are raised to new life just as Jesus was raised to new life. And Romans chapter 6 continues on then to tell us that what actually happened in that event, as we are brought into the participation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, is that our old nature is put to death and we are given a new nature. And we are brought out of death into life. And then we are encouraged because it is the character of the new nature to offer ourselves as tools, as implements in spiritual warfare for good. Instead of giving ourselves as instruments, as tools for evil. Recognizing that when we give ourselves as tools for evil, that we put ourselves back under bondage, slavery to sin, which will result in death. 
So we might say that we cannot save ourselves. But by the decisions that we make and the choices that we make, we can certainly condemn ourselves. It is not God, ultimately, then, who works the condemnation. He simply carries out the choices that we make. That if we are going to obey sin, if we are going to submit ourselves again to sin, which then goes back to the very question at the beginning of the chapter, should we sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Why not? Because the old nature that wants to sin is dead. And in its place, a new nature has been born, a new nature that desires to be obedient and do what is right for God. So we know, though, and Paul wrestles with this very notion in chapter 7, the reality of the life that we live. That, that old nature, though it has been put to death, is stubborn and doesn't want to die and keeps coming back and keeps enticing us and keeps tempting us and keeps doing everything that it can to pull us away from God. It lies to us. It twists God's word for us. It suggests to us that life apart from God would be a whole lot more fun. That there is a great deal more pleasure in satisfying the desires, the lusts of our flesh. And so there's this battle. The battle between our flesh, which wants to disobey God, and the new creation that wants to obey God and recognizes that God's law is good and perfect. And so we live in this battle. And the term that we have had applied to us to give some kind of understanding to this battle and some kind of reality to this battle is that we are at the same time, saint and sinner. We don't stop being sinners because we have been declared not guilty of our sin. That continues in us, and it will continue in us until we die. What we have, though, as a promise is Jesus. And the first verses of chapter 8 that say so powerfully and graciously to us that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That as long as we are living in repentance, that as long as we are willing to concede that this battle is real, that as long as we hate the sin that we do and strive not to do it, that as long as we continue to believe in Jesus and continue to confess our sins, we can trust that He is faithful and true and just and righteous and that He does forgive our sins, and that He does cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that He buries our sin in the deepest of the sea, metaphorically, that He does separate from us and Himself our sin, again, a metaphorical picture, as far as the east is from the west, infinitely separated from us. Some even suggest to the point that He has forgotten our sin. And so this is the great and wonderful promise that we have. First, we need to recognize the condition that we are saints. Saints not because we deserve it, not saints not because we can do anything. I cannot by my own reason or strength, but because Jesus has done for us. And the Father declares us not guilty of our sin, even though we are. That the Father imputes, credits, extends to us the righteousness of Jesus and takes in exchange our sin. 
so that we are indeed justified, so that we are indeed holy, so that we are indeed saints. And then we recognize at the same time that we continue to do this battle, that it is a lifelong battle. It is a battle, however, that's been won. And that when our faith is in Jesus to, to forgive our sins, and when we live in repentance and sorrow and grief, for every time we break God's heart, the promise is that there is no condemnation. That we can live in the assurance that we are in fellowship with God. That it is a fellowship that begins now and gives meaning and purpose to life now. And it is a fellowship that will continue for all eternity. At the same time, saint and sinner. Thanks for being a part of the conversation. God bless you.